And so we're going to begin with, with Susan. Hi. Thank um, you. Just a quick introduction. Yeah, so just your name and your association. I'm Sue Vanderbent. I'm the CEO of Home Care Ontario, a provincial association representing home care service providers across Ontario, and many of them are national as well. Hi, I'm Erna Buena with the Ontario Nurses Association, and I'm uh, the Occupational Health and Safety and Workers' Compensation Specialist. Hi, Henrietta Van Hall, Executive Director of Health and Community Services at PSHSA. Good morning. And I'm Susan Fucciarelli, so the two Susans sat next to each other. That's always the way that it happens. <laughs> and I'm the Director of Health Safety and Wellness at Hamilton Health Sciences. So Susan, we're going to have you kick it off for us. Okay, so everybody can call me Sue. Okay. <laughs> when I get called Susan, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> so it's ex-nay the Susan. This Susan is lovely. <laughs> For me, Susan doesn't have the best connotation. <laughs> so, very informal. So, I'll just take a, a few minutes to kind of set the stage for home care. And I understand from Catherine that there are a lot of folks here that are in many parts of the system, um, and a few from home care, community care. Um, and those who are in the home care and community care area, could you just let me know? Oh, so that's good. Good. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Good representation. Terrific. So um, I hope what I say is going to resonate with uh, those of you who work and live this every day. So I think this is a great uh, conference, and um, and Catherine just gave some very brief opening remarks about some research that Home Care Ontario is part of. It's a Ministry of Labour funded research, and we're looking at. Um, illnesses and injuries and stress in our PSW um, workforce, which is about 80% of the home care world. We have a much smaller percentage of uh, nurses and uh, therapists in home care. So a great deal of home care is being provided uh, by PSWs and their families. Who here is a family caregiver? Hands up. Oh, that's interesting. I don't usually get that. I usually get everybody saying, I have a mom, a dad. Nobody here has a mom or a dad or grandma. <laughs> that they're, they may, maybe have moms and dads, but they're golfing in Florida. Good, good. I, I hope they stay golfing. <clears throat> um, what we're in our preliminary research finding is it, good, good data, not great data, though, about 50% are of our PSWs are experiencing back problems, repetitive strain, um, problems in the shoulder, neck and hands. Uh, 56 reported a work injury due to repetitive strain. And um, so I, I think those numbers are important and, and there's more and this is preliminary so we're just, we're just trying to unpack it. So I'm, I'm going to try to unpack it just a little bit for you who don't work in the home care sector or the community care sector. So I went to a house the other day and a very slight framed PSW, about 110 pounds maybe, was trying to assist a 275 pound lady out of her bed, which was probably about two and a half feet off the floor because it's easy for this lady to get in and out of her bed. And because she um, is, has been lying in this bed quite a bit, the bed's hollowed out. So here we have a very slight framed uh, woman trying to help another woman who also has um, diabetes and, and some pretty nasty looking ulcers on her legs out of this bed and to toilet. So what is the most normal thing that we're asking people to do is toilet, right? So we're not toileting in that bed, we are toileting in the bathroom. So. The bedroom is very crowded with the memorabilia of a lifetime. Her knickknacks, her pictures, her things her grandchildren have made for her. Like you can picture it now and it's cluttered. And it's not cluttered because this lady is dirty. It is cluttered because she's lived there in this house for 60 odd years and raised her family here. And these things are mean something to her. So the little lady is trying to, the PSW, is trying to help the larger lady uh, get out of this bed uh, with one person 
No, no two-person transfers because home care is very rare to be able to get the funding for a two-person transfer or equipment. And when I hear my, my great friend Erna here talking about a robot in Australia, I think that's great. We're never going to get a robot <laughs> in this lady's house, right? So then we have to navigate through this narrow little hall, about 10 feet, into the bathroom. And there's the toilet. And you imagine the toilet, which is jammed up against the wall, which is jammed up against a bathtub. And there's barely a room to swing a cat, let alone turn this 275 pound lady, and I'm just guesstimating, with her sick legs, with her walker, safely to sit down on the toilet. Now, imagine all you MSD experts. Is this a place where we might see a musculoskeletal injury <laughs> or illness happening? Could this be? Yes, yes, it could happen. And this is how it happens. For the simple, simple act of getting a lady up in the morning to go to the bathroom <coughs> without an accident because she's been waiting there for you, for that PSW to come and help her. This is home care. Home care is travel. We have to travel. Home care is 30 minute visits. Now CCACs are asking us, the government is asking us to do 15 minute visits. So we've got a PSW rushing from one place to another to fulfill government requirements, society's requirements, all of us. I'm not blaming anybody here. We are all taxpayers um, and in home care, this is what is happening. So let's see. We have our slight framed PSW rushing from one bus to another on uh, icy streets to try to get to her next 15-minute appointment. Hmm, is there an opportunity for an MSD injury here? Yes, of course there is, of course there is. So we have rushing, we have travel, we have working alone. <clears throat> uh, we have inclement weather because we go to you. You don't come to us, right? Like, like in hospitals and long-term care in the institutional world. We work in a different environment. And this different environment has a host of issues that I hope this morning we can at least touch on so that you, in all your wisdom, and can help us because training is important. And I hear about training every single day in my with my members. They are training up the yin yang. But without equitable funding, without equitable access to services, equipment, and medical supplies in the home, this training is not as enough, and it's not enough to help with the MSD. The MSD problem is a tip of the iceberg, in my opinion. So I'll just leave you with one last comment. How much do we pay for a bandage in a hospital? Anybody hospital person here? Let's just say that the, that the equity between a bandage that your mother with her diabetic ulcer gets in the hospital versus what we pay for in home care is probably 20 bucks. So we're paying for high-end bandages in the hospital and when you cross that barrier into home care, you are getting the cheapest bandages <coughs> there are, depending on what area of the province you live in. This is, the, this is the underbelly of home care that we're not talking about. Right now, we're in all the fights with the Auditor General's report, and we're blaming and shaming everybody all over the place. The reality is we have fundamental structural issues of practice, policy, legislation, and funding. And that's where I'm opening with. Thank you for that, Sue. So we've heard home care, lack of room in the client's environment, the client characteristics are barriers, the worker characteristics form barriers, and the time to perform the tasks provide barriers and challenges. Are we seeing this in some of the other sectors? Maybe someone else could jump in now and talk about some of the challenges and barriers and maybe comment 
on some of the similarities or what other challenges you're facing? So we represent approximately 60,000 nurses across the province in allied health care. And so we have uh, members who are in home care, so everything that Sue just said, ditto. <laughs> uh, we have members in long-term care and in, obviously, hospitals. And yes, uh, for years, uh, what I didn't actually say was that for years, when I started at ONA, uh, one of my key jobs was to appeal WSIB cases on behalf of members <coughs> who were injured in the workplace. And uh, the majority of those injuries that I actually uh, represented on were uh, to, uh, for musculoskeletal disorders to the back, neck, shoulders, um, wrists, um, down to the knees, uh, you name it. And so often what we would find is that, you know, it was the uh, long hours, the fatigue, uh, they put in a 12-hour shift and then they're working more hours on top of the 12-hour shift. Uh, they're doing it short-staffed. I can't tell you how much short-staffing is going on these days. Uh, you know, if uh, someone calls in sick, often there's a policy not to replace the first sick call, so that puts additional strains on the workers who are now having to pick up that load. Sometimes even when the second call comes in, and you can imagine in the winter time when it's uh, snowing out and people are calling in because they can't get into work, those that are left there are doing double duty. And so it causes these additional strains. They also tell us about the, um, uh, the unpredictable patient. And so if you've got you know, the surgical, the step-down units, uh, you've got you know, the inpatient units, the eMERGE, the unpredictable patient where even though you're doing your best assessment that you can do, a patient still collapses or faints or falls to the floor. And you know, nurses have and feel this ethical duty to put patient safety first, and they will do it at their own expense. And that is always difficult to do in an environment when you're also short staffed. So when you're being asked to do patient assessments, you know, you, you really need to do, and, the, and I'm encouraging employers across the province as well, to really find the time to do proper risk assessments. So it's about saying, you know, what is the patient load that we have today? And then looking at, you know, encouraging and reminding staff you need to do the assessments. If we're short-staffed, giving them the tools to be able to do the assessment based on, you know, the amount of staff that they have available to them. And then figure out, okay, if someone's agitated that day, are you going to go do that transfer alone? If they normally are one person transferred, do you need two people? And where are the staff going, going to come from if you have to do it? And if you don't have the staff, encouraging the workers not to do the lift or the transfer. If someone falls to the floor, workers across the province, healthcare workers have a limited right to refuse unsafe work. However, in a situation where the, a patient does fall to the floor, there's this, you know, belief that because they're a nurse, they have to get the patient up off the floor and put them on the bed. Is that an opportunity for an MSD? Absolutely. You know, it's about then encouraging them, provide the best care you can, make them comfortable on the floor until help arrives and you can do it safely. So it's about reinforcing with staff and then I also encourage as well to have all of these things that you're telling staff to do, put them in writing. It's a requirement of law to actually have these policies and these procedures in writing. But often it's not put to writing or it's, it's buried in some great big program where no one can even find the information and so you can do all the training you want if it's not being reinforced and reevaluated and then also Train your supervisors. The training that you know supervisors across the province are getting are you know are the bare bones basics about what the law might teach. But what about your own internal policies? Are you teaching your supervisors about what the policies actually are, and for them to detect when there's a gap in the policy? And I always give this. It's, it's not an MSD. It's a, an example of a home visiting policy that one employer had, and it was you know sending workers from a hospital into a home to care for uh, patients in the long-term care facility. And when the worker, when the nurse arrived, what happened was she was put into a room with a patient who was up on charges for sexual assault, into a closed room with this patient. And when she came back, she said, and she found out about this, she went to her supervisor and she said, 
Like, why wasn't I told? What do I do? And she said, read the policy. Well, so I read the policy, okay? So it came to me and I read the policy and there was nothing, no guidance in that policy whatsoever about how staff and what staff should do when they arrive into another home. And the same goes for MSDs. If you're going into a home, then put it in a policy, make sure, and it's reinforced. Don't just write it, reinforce it. And you need to then ask staff to go and find out, you know, the people that I'm caring for if you're going into a nursing home. What are their risk factors? What do I have to be, you know, cautious of? You know, it's, it's about getting the information in home care. Oh my God, we talk about transfer of care issues. Uh, you know, all of us at the table have talked about it. Passing the information on and then doing the proper assessment. So from hospital, if you know that someone's a fall hazard, you have to make sure that the information gets passed on to the home. And the, if, you know, if it's not in a nursing home, then it gets passed on into the community. So there's just so many factors that, and the awkward, uh, awkward spaces, one would think that in a hospital you have more room than in a home, but in a hospital as well, there's so much hallway nursing that's going on because there's not enough free beds to actually get people admitted into the rooms, that there's a lot of stretchers and awkward you know, spaces to be doing this work. Well, I'm getting depressed. <laughs> We're certainly getting a sense of the challenges and the barriers here. Herna has highlighted, again, long hours, fatigue, short staff, lack of policies, unpredictable patient characteristics. How ethics come into play with how we operate. Um, lack of uh, proper assessments, all of which these items we're going to hear some of examples today of how organizations are handling this. Um, supervisors are trained. And again, space challenges. So lots of commonalities, different sectors. Who would like to share some other insights with us? Sue? Susan? Sure. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting as I'm listening to my colleagues talking uh, more so about home care, uh, Ernest touched on a lot of the issues that face the hospitals. Uh, with working in a hospital, and, and we have several hospitals at Hamilton Health Sciences, and even just the, you know, the cultural differences and the availability of equipment and resources from one facility to the next has a, a significant impact. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, another colleague this afternoon who is in, and has had the benefit of being involved in a new build, in a redevelopment for a brand new hospital and all of the wonderful things that they're able to do from a, an engineering standpoint and an ergonomic standpoint to um, to help minimize the, the risks. But when you're dealing with an older facility, and you know, as we've talked about even in the home care situation, uh, same holds true for hospitals. You have rooms that were, you know, in some cases these hospitals are, are very aging buildings. They don't have ceiling lifts installed. Uh, the beds are, you know, maybe a foot and a half away from each other. Uh, trying to get the equipment, trying to even store the equipment in an accessible way so that the healthcare worker can access it is a real challenge. We also find um, because of the funding, as Sue has mentioned, throughout the healthcare sector, that having the, uh, not just the, the requisite resources to be conducting the patient care, but in order to do that training, in order to do that education, it becomes very, very challenging to take that nurse off the floor, to take that healthcare worker off the floor, because that patient care still needs to happen and there aren't extra resources. So it becomes very difficult to have that type of conversation and to, to do the right thing for the healthcare workers uh, to get them that adequate training. So my perspective is that we need to really reinforce uh, both from a funding perspective but also from a senior management perspective the importance of providing adequate resources, adequate training to our frontline healthcare workers. And you know we've been fortunate because we, we have that kind of buy-in. Uh, we have that kind of leveraging, if you will, 
uh, from our, our senior management where they recognize the importance. But of course it comes at a cost. And the cost for us has been you know, demonstrating to our senior leaders uh, the, not just the financial cost, but all of the, the other costs that go along with somebody being injured. Uh, unfortunately, MSDs are still our number one injury type. Uh, it, in our facilities, they're actually uh, above the industry average, so we're closer to 50% of our injuries being uh, MSD related. And it's not just about, as Erna said, uh, you know, having that, that nurse being available on the floor, because if that nurse calls in sick, or, or calls in and is not available for a day, two days, three days, whatever the case may be, that extra burden is going on the, the balance of the coworkers. And that's, that's just a reality. So we need to be very mindful of that, and we need to have the appropriate resourcing um, not just at the frontline levels, but the support. So from a health and safety perspective, uh, what is the support that is being provided? Um, are there ergonomists on the scene that have the expertise in MSDs and are able to uh, not only identify what the risk factors are, but also to identify what some of the real working solutions are? So we need to ensure that we've got those adequate resources where possible, you know, retrofitting some of the rooms with equipment. Where it's not possible to retrofit rooms, we need to ensure that equipment is not only available, but it's accessible, and it's in working order. This is another big issue that, you know, we see. Um, there are lifts, and there aren't adequate slings for the lifts. Um, they're not readily accessible. I, I did a tour of one of our units uh, a couple of weeks back, and the director said, okay, Sue, I'm gonna show you where the lifts are. And we walked down, a, again, a very narrow hallway because this is one of the, the older facilities. And the storage room was, I don't know, maybe six by four. And all of this equipment was jammed into the storage room. So, you know, and the lift was, of course, right at the very back. So A, that tells you it's not used very often just based on, on its physical location, and B, if somebody did want to use it, it would take them probably a minimum of 15 minutes to move all of that equipment around to, to get to that lift. And when you have a patient who is waiting to go to the bathroom, a nurse is not gonna take that 15 minutes to go and get that equipment. So we need to you know, look at the design, we need to look at the accessibility of equipment, we need to look at putting uh, our money where our mouth is, quite frankly, and, and saying that this is a really important issue and it's costing the industry millions and millions of dollars for the sick time that results from these MSD injuries. So what are we going to do to prevent them? And what are we going to do from not just a policy standpoint, but a, a training standpoint, equipment, and investing in our people? Healthcare workers are patient focused and patient safety is their number one priority. Why is it that there's so much emphasis on patient safety, yet so little on staff safety? We have to manage that equilibrium so that we have that same level of focus and that same level of passion around protecting our healthcare workers as we do around protecting our patients. Well, you've ignited my passion. I wanna go over there and fix these things. And I'm horrified about not replacing somebody on the first sick call that I heard about. That, that makes me ill. And I wouldn't want to be one of those team members. Can you imagine the, the, the camaraderie or lack of camaraderie every time someone is sick? You feel that person has let you down. And so that's a huge challenge. Cultural differences. So the, I, I heard, a, you know, you spoke a little bit about cultural differences. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that today. Rooms again, size, just like in the home. Rooms, we don't have ceiling lifts in home care by and large, but it sounds like a lot of hospitals by and large don't have ceiling lifts, especially if they're older. Storing equipment, you know, who thinks of those things? You know, storing them, making them accessible. The backfill, huge, huge HR challenge. The importance of training, we all know it, 
let, you know, how do we get the staff there? How do we pay for the staff to get there and then be backfilled? And, and having experts. And we heard this at the PSW conference last week. PSWs were saying, you know, I don't want to be an expert in everything. But some of, some of us want to be experts in patient handling and transferring. So why can't we look at that and, and, and maybe some of the solutions around specialization? Um, we also heard about um, accessibility of equipment. And we're going to hear today about how the laundry staff is the biggest source of backup because they're the ones cleaning the slings, making sure that they're stretched so they don't shrink, that they're ready to use. And if it wasn't for that laundry staff, I mean, who, you know, we don't normally think about the people in the back room there. So there's, there's lots of processes that are involved in helping us prevent MSDs. So I'm going to ask Henrietta and then um, just encourage the panel here without me coming back up here to, to just maybe make a few comments and then we'll open it up for questions. Richard. Okay. Okay. So I I'm, I'm, have a couple of slides. Not that I'm going to speak to them, but I just want to um, show you a bit of a good news story. I'm tired of Catherine being depressed up here. So I'm going to show you a picture of hope, shall we say, when we look at what is happening in healthcare. And I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that PSHSA um, services or tries to support all of the different sectors or rate groups within healthcare. And certainly, musculoskeletal disorders are still the largest injur injury type in all of healthcare. And uh, client handling, particularly for um, hospital, long term care, and community care sector, is the biggest risk. So, on the slide, you can see the red line is musculoskeletal disorders related to client handling. So since 2010, we are showing a decrease. So there's our positive piece. The top blue line is other musculoskeletal disorders, so those that are not related to lifting, transferring, and repositioning. So again, we are making inroads um, on the MSD front, and we should be encouraged by that. Go to the next slide. So this is what it looks like across the different rate groups. So hospitals had 395 client handling claims in 2014, and this is just based on the top 10 occupations, or the, the, to the top 10 occupations with the highest number of injuries. Nursing homes, 359, followed by home care with 234. And in the hospital sector, those 395 claims, that's the top injury category in hospitals. And for both nursing homes and home care, it's the second highest injury type. So certainly significant. So what do you think this costs us? You ready? $22 million. What could we do in Ontario with 22 million more dollars in healthcare? So even though the, this, the graph shows that we are moving in the right direction, there's still a lot we can do. And this is just the dollar figure. We're not even talking about the human uh, costs that are associated with claims here in, uh, in Ontario <coughs> into our healthcare workers. A couple of the barriers that we see uh, at PSHSA um, when it comes to client handling is a, a bit of lack of knowledge of the legislation. So surprisingly, the Occupational Health and Safety Act is over 30 years old and the healthcare regulation has been around for you know, uh, uh, almost that long and there are still people who don't understand that the law says if you have equipment for safety, you have to maintain it that you have to provide training and instruction for workers, 
that you have to teach them how to use the devices. Um, that supervisors have a responsibility to make sure um, all of their workers know what the hazards are when they're doing the work and then that they know how to deal with those hazards. That the worker has a responsibility. It's illegal if your hospital has or your nursing home has a policy that says you have to use a lift. It is against the law not to use a lift. So there are lots of challenges and barriers that we hear um, to getting that lift and getting it in place but the requirement is there for everyone to facilitate that use. So the employer has to look at what they can do to manage it. The supervisors have to look at what they can do to make sure workers can use it. And then the workers need to use it themselves and encourage their coworkers as well to use the appropriate equipment. Another um, issue that we see is knowledge translation. So it is not just about the theory of preventing injuries, but it's the practical piece. And certainly we've heard of organizations who have done really great work at implementing training programs and having peer coaches and mentors on the unit who do the face-to-face uh, -face training on how to use the lifts, who talk about it at team meetings. But we also hear of some organizations who put a video in and then send their staff off and expect them to know how to use a complicated lift and get a patient into a sling or to perform a two-person transfer with a transfer belt by watching a video. And that is not true um, effective use of training. One of the other key pieces, um, again, is that when we talk about um, using equipment is that in many cases and not of course in home care as Sue mentioned but there's often a policy to use two people for lifts and transfers and the challenge is if there are not two people available on the unit for whatever reason and we certainly heard about some of the uh, the challenges with that from the other panelists when uh, an incident happens it is required that you do an investigation. So the, the important piece here is doing a root cause analysis, trying to figure out what actually led to this injury. So uh, Susan talked about the lift in the back corner of the crowded training room. So if a, a injury happened to a healthcare worker, because they didn't use a mechanical lift. It's digging down and finding out why they didn't use that lift. And then what are we going to do about that lift that's stuck in the corner that nobody uses because they can't get to it? And that's really the, the true root cause analysis that needs to happen when injuries occur. We've already talked about maintenance. People have talked about the transition of care. So the, um, the, the health care system is very fluid. People are moving between different sectors and subsectors uh, very frequently. They're going from hospital to nursing home, from nursing home back to hospital, from hospital to home care, and bouncing around all over the place. And there, there is a, you know, a moral and ethical <coughs> responsibility to make sure the next person who is providing services also knows what the risk is. The Occupational Health and Safety Act says the employer has to make sure but when you're moving between employers and between different subsectors, it's making sure that communication happens. So I would, I would suggest that uh, 22 million is dollars that we can't afford to leave um, um, unused in, in Ontario and we have to think about other ways to continue to decrease the injuries to our healthcare workers. I just wanted to say I've worked very closely with one large employer on uh, a return to work program that is also looking at uh, looking at return to work in a different way and that is to identify the barriers to return to work. So not just looking at what are the restrictions and let's make that person an extra because we see that happening across the province. And so when you're developing a plan, it's really to dig down to say what is the barrier and how do I remove the barrier? So if, just to give you a quick example, you can do this for MSDs as well, but all of you who are wearing glasses, okay, 
um, think about yourself and can you see, take your glasses off, okay, if you do it, <laughs> take your glasses off, okay, now you have a disability, right, you can't see, right, or you may not, you see a little bit but not as well, but put your glasses back on and you've been accommodated, the barrier's been removed, right, and if you think about it from that perspective when you're also bringing people back with MSD injuries, you have to find out what is the barrier and actually then find the solutions. And one of the things that we would encourage is that when you're going out and you're thinking about return to work, don't just isolate the solution to that worker. Think about it from a systematic perspective. And if something worked in one unit, and in this particular, with this employer, we always use this tugger example, they, they found that one worker needed a tugger to be actually something, think of the grocery stores, which moves all those carts around, okay? So if one tugger could get that worker back to work, then is that something that could be used in other units and other sites? And so as soon as managers, so they shared the information with managers, and then I think it was another two managers purchased tuggers in their units. And it's about sharing the information. So thinking about uh, outside the box, it's, and, and when you're developing these return to work plans, don't just think about bringing them back as an extra because you're transferring the risk. You're not actually fixing the problem, right? And, um, you know, although the statistics on paper look good, I, I'm just going to paint some gloom again, uh, because I hate WSIB statistics more than anything else. I think they're not very reliable at all. Because, honestly, I can tell you, our nurses, quite frankly, and WSIB has taken a whole new approach to denying claims that they've ever done in the past. And our nurses will just go on sick time benefits because it's way easier than collecting WSIB benefits. So, so what that does is transfer costs to another, to sick time, okay, or to just regular payroll to the employer. So is it really reducing the costs associated with what the employer pays out? No, it's just shifted it, in my opinion. But. So I'm going to um, ask if there's any questions from the floor for any of the panelists around some barriers, maybe your challenges that you haven't heard about that are resonating with you. Because again, this is setting the scene of all the challenges and barriers because after this we're going to hear about how to fix all of it right so is there anything that someone hasn't heard about that your sector is facing that's a challenge or a barrier at the back there uh, the median age of the uh, healthcare worker yes. i think that uh, we're looking at uh, average age of 56 in our organization yeah, and when, when as a, a healthcare worker ages, it takes them longer to return to work. So the cost um, of returning someone to work increases as age increases as well. So I'm going to ask if you can to use the mic. It's helpful. So that is that was an excellent comment. That one of the challenge and barriers is the medium, the age. So in healthcare, we have an older worker as a staff, and we're not. We're not getting younger workers, certainly in the home care, the community care sector. That's a huge challenge. Other, other challenges that we missed? Terry? Uh, it, it might have been said, uh, because rushing around, um, I'm health and safety officer at OPSU, and some of my workers that work in community health care talk about forced overtime. There's a certain number of uh, patients that have to be seen in a day and a certain number of staff rushing around a city with worse traffic, like you said, um, but forced overtime, working for, like getting pages at uh, 10 to 4 when their shift ends at 4 and having to stay another couple of hours every day, uh, partly because there's not enough staff in the first place. Excellent. And that creates less time that they can stay at each house um, and then the psychosocial aspects of all of that. Excellent comment. Other ba uh, barriers or challenges that we missed? Um, I'm Cindy DiPiro. I work for the Sierra Hospital. I think one of the things that we're not hitting on is the wellness of our people. They don't have the time to take care of themselves. And that uh, obviously affects how they work at, at, at work and what the steps are to do things properly and to be safe. So that's one piece I think we're all missing out on, how to think outside the work uh, four walls as well. Excellent. Yes. Um, yes, I work. 
Oh, is this on or no? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, I work in physiotherapy in uh, in uh, health in um, occupational health, so I see I treat a lot of staff as well as the return to work. And one of the things I'm seeing now is in the acute care setting is the shortened lengths of stay and all these sort of tracks that everybody has to be on, which, whichever unit you're on, hip and knees or different areas. So basically we're moving into like an acuity level on all levels, so that patient then is less mobile, so we're getting them in and out very quickly. So the type of patient that we're treating, there's not a balanced caseload all across. So then that goes out into the community and it's, it's kind of the direction of funding, but it's also the direction of the type of patient we're seeing as well. So staff are commenting on, they have no easy patients in their caseload, they're all like acute, less mobile patients relatively, and there's a the pressure to get them out. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Boy, panel, we didn't hit everything, did we? Imagine there's more. Over here. Yeah, um, thanks. I work as a union organizer and rep with Workers United. Um, and I would, first of all, uh, echo the point that was last made, but specifically in, in home care, um, recognizing the fact that employers are just sometimes not in compliance with the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, around investigating workplace injuries. Um, also specifically, um, we're organizing uh, in the for-profit sector, so with the de desire of the employer to, to make money, there's pressure to understaff. So we have um, situations where regularly, you know, in terms of, you know, even what would be required by the internal policy or the CCAC policy for lifts to have two workers be present, we are seeing regularly uh, the employer assigning one worker and saying, you know, Mrs. Smith's son can help uh, lift her into the bath. Um, and then, you know, either he's not trained to do that or is not present or is not willing, seeing, you know, rightly or wrongly that it's not his job to do that. Um, so, I mean, this is somewhere that we're really struggling around, you know, the st structural issues of, you know, the interests of the worker and the client and the desire for the employer to, you know, at the best stay cost effective or make money at the expense of uh, patient and uh, worker care. I just have to say, uh, I, I agree with what you've just said, and, and just from a personal experience, I know my mother is in a lot, was in a retirement home, and you know they were very, uh, the administrator really wanted to push to have her in bed by nine o'clock because after nine o'clock, she couldn't have a two-person lift, lift because the staff were being sent home, and we actually, as a family, then had to pay to have the extra person there to help lift her so that she could stay up longer because that's what she was used to. And that's just wrong. And Sue talked about the funding and the money that's needed. And I think we all really have to become advocates to get better funding into the homes and into you know these long-term care facilities and into the community care as well everywhere because it's just wrong that you know families and not everyone has the money to do that. And so then it's a quality of life, right? You've reduced the quality of life of that person. So that, that whole comment uh, that was just made around the cost effectiveness, the challenge of, of remaining cost effective and at what price for the client and the worker. I think it's uh, pretty important that we not focus on corporate tax status as a fundamental uh, part of the problems that we have here. It's such an easy place to go. Uh, the metrics that all of these organizations are held to are exactly the same by government, exactly the same. And they have to perform or they lose their contracts, right? So this is not, this is not in my opinion, the place to, to say, yes, that's, that is the problem. We're, what is, as Henrietta said, the root cause? So I would argue very strongly, um, and I just say, couple little things about funding for home care. Uh, home care is funded at 5% of the total proportional health care spend in Ontario. And we proportionally spend $45 billion a year. So we're putting two, about $2.8 billion into home care. It's, it's an egregious disproportion of funding that's going into home care. And I'm the biggest advocate for more funding, uh, but but also all of the things that you offer. So 
uh, I mean, stru the, the structural problems that we have are far greater than the corporate tax status of the delivery system because we're, we're all, in a sense, victims. I didn't mention the families. I think that lady spoke very eloquently about families. We would not be able to deliver home care without the families. Families are the backbone of the home care system because we rely on your elderly mom or dad to help your elderly mom or dad, right? It's them that's bearing the brunt. And if they can't do it, and if the publicly funded system is so stretched that it can't provide, then people do purchase. And we should be actually grateful that there's an opportunity to purchase because when you are desperate and you call up someone and say, could you help somebody here to help me and help my family so my mom doesn't have to go into a long-term care home, then that's a good thing. So I think we have to reframe this whole, that, that whole issue. But I wanted to say something positive because I feel like I've been such a gloom and doomer. <laughs> That's our panel's job. <laughs> and I haven't job. worked all these years in this sector to, to say, you know, throw in the hat. Because I actually think people want to live at home, people want to recuperate at home, and people want to die at home. If you ask any person in this room, how, would you like to, like, hands up, those of us who are hoping to go into a long-term care facility. <laughs> that's, that's the place I want to be, right? I want to be at home. And I want a robot, and I want a Google car, <laughs> all of that stuff. And I want a better system of publicly funded uh, home care, and I want access to a privately funded system of home care, because it's happening right now. 150,000 Ontarians, this is what we, we estimate 150,000 Ontarians are already purchasing 20 million hours of care. And that's probably low acuity care, the companionship, and you know somebody that will come in and somebody that will make a cup of tea and be able to spend more than 15 minutes with me and do more than throw me on the toilet and pick me up, throw me back in the bed, right? I mean, this is the reality. And you, as the, the, the middle-aged child, cannot afford to be there. You can't afford to be. You've got a job, you've got all these, all these other obligations. So yes, people are paying. And yes, they are probably keeping people from going into the ER. But the reality is, we want to live at home. We, we want to die at home. We, we don't want to go into the hospital unless we absolutely have to. We certainly don't want to be institutionalized. So, Sue, I want to I want to thank you for um, I want to thank you for just highlighting for highlighting the um, the families. Um, that was another barrier for those of us who don't have families to assist, and there are many clients who don't have families to assist. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panel. You have certainly pointed out many, many substantial challenges and barriers that do not just affect one sector in healthcare to prevent MSDs, but affect all of us. So we have a lot of commonalities and there's a huge opportunity today for us to learn from one another of what is working 